Hi, and welcome to Deep Leadership. I'm your host, John Rennie. Well, I hope all is well with you today. It is another beautiful day here in North Carolina. And this episode is brought to you by our sponsors, Leader Connect, Ignite Management Services, and Liberty Strength. These sponsors help me bring these shows to you each and every week. So I encourage you to click on their links below and check them out. Well, that is it. Today, we're talking about communicating powerfully. And my guest is Gabe Zickerman. As you well know, leadership is about getting things done through other people, which means that communication is an essential leadership skill. And we've all sat through death by PowerPoint presentations. That's not communication, that's torture. Gabe helps us understand what it takes to become a skillful leadership communicator in this essential episode. So are you ready to dive in? Let's get started. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Gabe Zickerman. Gabe is an entrepreneur, author, investor, and leader whose books, speeches, and workshops focus on gamification and behavioral design. Companies such as Apple, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Amazon have adopted Gabe's theories and practices, leading to significant increases in revenue over time. A frequent keynote speaker and speaking coach, He's helped hundreds of successful entrepreneurs, executives, and celebrities communicate beautifully in all settings. His new book is called The AHA Method, Communicating Powerfully in a Time of Distraction. I'm excited to have him on the show to learn more about how to be a better communicator. So Gabe, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, John. It's good to meet you. It's good to meet you. So, um, uh, yeah, communication skills. It's such an important element of, of, oh, yeah. of leadership. So give us a feel, feel for why leaders especially need to have uh, good public speaking skills. So I think one one thing when I reflected on my career, you know, I, I was always sort of a chatty person. So speaking was never something that, it, that intimidated me. But, you know, there's a very big gap between being someone who likes to speak and being somebody who can command a room. And early in my career, I sort of happened upon several opportunities to really, you know, leverage that nascent uh, skill set because I was I was thrust into a couple of jobs where executives left an opening for somebody to do public speaking because they didn't want to. So, for example, my first I co-founded this uh, my first exit I co-founded a games platforms company called Tri Media, and my co-founder who was the CEO said from the jump he's like I don't want to do any public facing stuff. I'm a very private person. I don't like public speaking. So I was like, okay, well, I'll do it. And he's like, great, you do it. And what I started to realize, what I found out really quickly, John, was that every speech that I gave, every meeting that I led, every conversation I had with the media, every panel I was on, every single one turned into sales, revenue, and recruitment. Mm -hmm. Everyone, not a one. I have never done a speech that did not yield me additional money of some kind afterwards, exposure money, leads, whatever the case may be. It is far and away the most powerful personal, you know, branding and personal power platform that exists. It's been, you know, obviously recognized for, you know, the better part of human society, right? The power of being able to give a speech. But I think now what we're starting to realize and why I chose to write the AHA method was that I think executives, leaders at every level, whether you're doing your first startup or you're a mid-level manager or, or whatever the case may be, now need a new approach to communication for the world we live in now, where people are very distracted mm-hmm. and are able to then take these techniques and use them in all forms of communication to improve their career. So that that was really the impetus. Okay, okay. And so talk to us about the distractions. What do you mean by that today? I mean, I think I know what it means, but (laughs) okay. So, okay. So I'm in my like living forties. Um, and so, you know, when we were kids, right, we do were expect, especially in in college or university and, you know, you, uh, you know, through your background, you also probably had this experience with various kinds of educators, like in the military, you were expected to sit there and pay attention for 45 minutes, sometimes 90 minutes, right. In a shop, you sat you watched, you took notes, you listened. Sometimes you got to ask a question. Sometimes questions were asked of you. You were required to maintain full attention for extended periods of time. Today, this is just not how the school operates. This is not how the workplace operates. I mean, right now we're, you know, we're using telepresence. You and I are not in the same room together. Uh, I don't know what you're doing behind the screen. Hmm. 
you lead a Zoom meeting with 15 people from your from your organization, people are doing different things. They're literally in front of a screen while they're talking to you, which gives them the opportunity to be distracted. Their phones are buzzing in their pockets and all kinds of things are going through their head. The world is a you know, crazy place. And so you can't by default, if you're a communicator, even if you are literally the people manager of the people you're trying to communicate with, even if they report to you, you cannot assume that you have their complete and full attention for the duration of any meeting or conversation that you're having. You have to earn it. So they'll give you a little bit of attention by default, and then you need to earn the rest of their attention over the rest of that period of time. Mm. In order to do that, you've got to overcome some of the um, things which are, you know, which are realities, and that's the distracted nature of our lives today. The applications that are running on your phone, your spouse, your kids, you know, whatever's going on around you. And so, you know, public speaking and communication now needs to take that into consideration. And so when I wrote the AHA method, I wrote it with a behavioral science view that says, I can't just expect you're paying attention to me. I need to work to maintain that attention over mm. a period of time. I love that you say that you have to earn the attention because I know, you know, I, I did 22 years in corporate and I can tell you I've sat through some really bad speeches. And oh I gosh. think when when someone gets up on stage, you they have your attention. You're like, okay, this okay. is going to be good. I'm looking forward to this this guy. I mean, I'm mean, looking forward to hear what he has to say. Yep. And so you start like you're engaged, right? And then they and they get on with the presentation. And if they don't capture your attention, if it isn't interesting, what's the first thing you do? You're like, oh, okay. Well, yeah. Then then you you pull your phone out of your pocket. You look down to see what's going on. Look at Twitter. See what's good. I mean, you literally just say, "This is I, this is this is boring." I'm I've got yes, I'm out. I've got other things to do. So I love what yeah. you say there that you have to overcome the distraction. You have to earn. Uh, their attention, their continued attention. They will grant you initial attention by default. If they're polite people, they will grant you initial attention just by virtue of the fact that an organizer has chosen to elevate you to the stage right. just by virtue of that. And the audience has chosen to pay money or devote their time to being in the room because nobody, you know, typically like that's, that's in many cases, it's not something they absolutely have to do. Right. Um, so they, they want to hear you. Most audiences want to hear what you have to say. They, they believe that you have something interesting to say, but most people sort of take that and they sort of waffle that initial. Yeah, uh, initial I think you're right. So, so you almost have an earned, you have that earned um, attention in the beginning, but as soon as the words come out of your mouth, as soon as your piece, speech starts, you can lose that very quickly. Yep. So what, 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 do you, what are some things uh, that you help when you're coaching entrepreneurs and leaders when they're doing public speaking, how do you overcome distractions and earn the attention? Okay. So first things first, the most important detail of this book, it's going to sound really simple. If, if you only take away one thing from this conversation and you don't buy the book and you don't read it, which I encourage you to do, but even if you only take one thing away from this conversation, it is that you must put as much effort into every communication moment that you have with some with a group, you have to put in as much effort as the possible return that you're going to get. Mm. Now, what does that mean in practice? If you don't put the effort and energy into plan, practice, get feedback and execute, then you're going to get back from the audience what you put into it. That's the reality. Mm. You know, even you know, even the Rolling Stones rehearse their old songs and they have played them thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Yeah. yeah. Right. It, they, even they rehearse them. Even they get the band together and do a rehearsal before every single show they ever do. So you can't tell me that as a CEO of a company or a startup or a sales leader or, you know, a thought leader that you can just walk up on stage without having done the work and perform at the level of the Rolling Stones. You will not. That is not how it works. So it is a craft that requires investment. And when I coach people, I don't coach a ton of people, to be honest with you. Like my, my coaching clients tend to be, like, for example, I'm a shark on Shark Tank, like pe people like that. I don't do a lot of like individual coaching these days. But uh, when, I, when I do coach people, the first thing that I do is I try to intimidate them by telling them that every talk that I do, if I do a speech or a keynote, I will have run that keynote 20 to 30 times before getting up on stage. And I'll tell them up front, if you're not willing to put that effort in, I'm not the guy for you. If you're looking for somebody to like, give you tips and tricks that will 
give you a hacky way to be better at public speaking. I'm going to be the first person to tell you there are lots of tips and tricks. There are lots of hacks. There are lots of approaches you can use to get better. But the number one most important one is you got to show up. And you got to do the work. And if you're not willing to do that, this isn't for you. It's interesting you say that because I, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who have given the, you know, TED TED talks and that the effort they say that goes into that, you know, 10, 12 minute speech is, is like months, months of work, months, months. of practice. Like yeah. I've, I've yeah. met some really talented leaders who say yeah. that's one of the more difficult things they've ever done was preparing for a TED talk. Yeah. And the TED, TED talk is just one form factor, right? It's got a lot of good things you're learning. So like in the aha method, I talk a lot about these aha moments, right? These are these high points in your speech that represent the things that get people really excited and engaged and mm. the hair stands up on the back of their neck. But more importantly, it's also the things that people remem remember. So it's the, it's, you know, they're not going to remember every word you said in 30 minutes, but they might remember two or three things you said. And so those aha moments are meant to be those two or three things. And so one of the things that, that we often talk about is like, you know, you need to carefully craft where those aha moments are in your talk and how they're delivered in your talk. In order to do that, you need to do the talk many, many, many times to get that, you know, to get the the salt um, correct. You don't want to over season the moment. If you overdo it, it's too much and people tune you out and you don't want to underdo it. So you've got to get kind of the balance exactly right. Um, but yes, it takes a lot of work. And, and incidentally, I tell people the same thing, even, even for like a big meeting, you know, you're going out and doing investor pitches or you're doing your IR, if you're a public company, uh, you do that roadshow, you better practice that roadshow speech, man. Are you going to go, you're going to go on CNBC, you, you know, you're going to go talk to Kramer. You better be ready. You mm -hmm. better have rehearsed that. Like, you know, even, I mean, you just need to do, you need to take it seriously. So step number one, take it seriously. Step number two, make an investment relative to the, the right level of return. And then three, watch, if you do that well, watch how it turns into money because it turns into money. You know, it's interesting because I think we live in a world where everybody wants the uh, hack. They want the simple, yes, easy, what's the, what's, the, what's the hack to giving a good public speech? And you're like, there is no hack. It's hard work. You got to practice. You got to spend time look, working on it. And I love that because I, I'm, 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 I'm an anti-hack person because I found in my career... Yeah. Hard work has always been the thing that's been successful, that's led me to success. So it's yeah. interesting to hear you say, if you want to be a great public speaker, you got to do the work. Yeah, I'm prepping, listen, I'm prepping for another TED Talk, which I'm about to do in, in about a week or 10 days. Um, and, you know, they they gave me a speaking coach. I took the speaking coach. Can you, like, I, I mean, I wrote a book on public speaking. <laughs> yeah. And they they offered me a speaking coach. And I said, yes, absolutely. I'll take this. Yeah, coach. yeah. They, they laughed at it. They're like, All right, we have a speaking coach you want to take it on. Absolutely. Hmm. Why, why is somebody like me who wrote a book like the Ahmed that taking a speaker coach? I want the feedback. Yeah. I yeah. want to hear. I want all the help that I can get because I'm taking this really seriously. Yeah. And I'm doing meetings with the speaker coach at six o'clock in the morning so that I can fit it in because I also have other things I do, right? Not just in this talk. So even busy executives with a huge calendar of things to do, you, if you care about it enough, you can make the time to do it. And, you know, what I hope to accomplish with this book is I really hope to accomplish this, this idea that like, I, I do think that in a non-hacky way, you can bring meaningful techniques to bear, to be better at this, at this work. So it's not like you weren't necessarily just born with it. Cause I think some people also believe that that's, that's the case, you know, like you're born a good public speaker and yes, but practice is still a big piece of it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you talk about these aha moments, the moments that, yeah. that we all remember. And, and I can think of, you know, dozens of speeches where there's that one moment that you, everybody, you know, the, the, you have, you have everyone's attention. Um, how, can you give us maybe some examples of, of that or, or how, how to create maybe examples of how to do or how to create those aha moments? Yeah. So I'll give you a really good example from this you know, this talk that I'm about to do, because I think it's, I think it's kind of, uh, I think it's kind of important that maybe we'll set the stage for you a little bit on the, on the theory. Okay. So, um, so, you know, right now at this point, 15% of American men say that they don't have a single close friend. Mm. And that number is double for men under the age of 30. Both of these numbers have increased 500% 
in the space of one generation. Mm. They're up 500% in one generation. 15% of men, no friends. 30% of men under 30, no friends. 500% increase, you know, in one generation, love those balloons. Um, you know, these are all, these are all things that uh, should be really shocking and surprising to you when you hear it. And so you ask yourself the question, like, what does a world look like in which the majority of people do not have a close friend? Because given the current trajectory, by the time this next generation goes to high school, they will, the majority of people will not have a single close friend. How does that radically, does that not radically reshape the society that we're living in and all the, and many of the structures that we come to rely on? So that's kind of, if, if you want to think of it that way, that's the sort of aha method setup and and presentation. And I gave you in that little trunk various levels of emotionality. Mm-hmm. Each time I gave you that stat, right? I was giving you a little bit of emotion and then I'm heightening. It's getting bigger. It's 15% for all men. Then it's 30% for men under 30. And it's 500% in a generation, right? I'm heightening, I'm heightening, mm-hmm. heightening. Yeah. But I'm not yet reaching the the sort of you know highest point of that. And the highest point of that is, can you imagine a world in which the majority of people don't have a close friend? Yeah. What does that world yeah. look like, right? So my aha moment is really built on these facts. It's building to this crescendo, and that's the moment. And crucially, and this is, I talk about this in the book, crucially, the next most important thing after I deliver that to you is I've got to give you some time to reflect and digest what I just said. And many speakers are very bad at that. Mm-hmm. They'll deliver a super important thing that everybody needs to hear, and then they won't give people any room to process it, and they'll immediately move on to the next topic without any space. So what I did, if you go back and listen to it again, I time filled a little bit there. Give you a little space. I repeated myself a little bit. I slowed down. I gave you some room to tune me out for a second so you could kind of digest all the things that I was saying in the in in the conversation. So these aha moments are, you know, really need to be carefully crafted. You can only do two to three in a 30 minute time frame, not more. People won't remember more. Um, and when we build a talk, we really build a talk like around that. We use those aha moments as the tent poles that we build around. You know, I think about it in terms of storytelling. I mean, I, I know storytelling yeah. is a powerful way to to keep people's attention. And, you know, in my books are filled with stories because my life has been full of stories. So I like to tell stories, but I've yeah. always, be- you know, is, is I, I've had writing coaches that talk about, you know, building tension. And in and, and that, as you build the tension, you know, the, the, the audience leans in, they're like, you know, what's going to happen next? And uh, you don't want to leave that tension. You want, you want to relieve it, but you, but that's the whole, you know, as far as storytelling is concerned, that's how you keep people going. You maybe pull a little bit on that attention. You, you'll give them a little bit and then they're like, what's going to happen next? And, right. uh, and that's, a, and so I think what you're saying is that aha moment is that, that, that tension is like, like that's what I felt when you were telling my story. The yeah. tension went all the way. That rubber band was pulled all the way, and you're like, "Yes, that's right." How are we going to figure this out? You know, like, yeah, what's the right. solution? You know. Yep. Storytelling is a very big piece of it. I even have there's several chapters on storytelling. We talk a lot about standard story structure of Act One, Act Two, Act Three. Most truly really successful kind of talks follow that structure. And one thing about storytelling that's really important is, I think when people think about a smaller meeting so not a ted talk but more like a investor presentation or yeah. a you know we're an all hands meeting or an annual meeting right with with the staff um i don't think most leaders put the right amount of storytelling effort into those kinds of conversations like people say yes it's obvious i need that for my for my ted talk or for my keynote but even these smaller meetings a little bit of storytelling a little a little pizzazz a little thought about story structure and, you know, I know we, we're we not into hacks here, but one big lesson <laughs> everybody is a, a big lesson about this is um, don't give away the story before you tell the story. Yeah. So yeah. classically, when we were told how to do, remember how we were told to do an essay? Yeah. Our essays were lay out the hypothesis, then the three supporting points, then repeat the hypothesis. You cannot do a compelling talk with that structure. Yeah. Because if you give people the hypothesis up front, if you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you repeat it, and then you repeat it one more time, they have tuned you way out. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. I, you know, it's funny. I do a little bit in the in the storytelling in my books. Like I'll I'll start the chapter with saying, 
you know, uh, I, I heard shots fired, you know, topside, right. you know, like if that, yep. I was a submarine officer, I heard shots fired topside. And then yep. that's how I started the chapter. And they're like, wait, what? And then, and then I tell the story of how, so I yep. give, I give sort of a crescendo in the immediate. And then I talk and then I build the whole story up to the, how I got to that moment type of thing. But it's one of those things. It's like, you, you, you don't give it away. You sort of give like this mystery thing and, and that, and you pull that tension and, and they're like, huh, what's going to happen? You know? And I, I love that. It don't, don't relieve that tension too early. You want to keep no, that don't going. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't do it. And also don't waste the first, you know, let's say 20 seconds with anything other than content that moves the story forward. Another mistake that a lot of people make is they get up and they start with, oh, hello, everybody. So great to be here. Really glad to see you all. I'm so happy I could come and join you. Uh, my name's Gabe Zickerman. I wrote a book called The Aha Method. Now let me tell you what I'm going to tell you. Mm. That time in there with the preamble is such a waste if I use it that way. And it's, you've got to develop, you've got to develop a thick skin because it's not socially polite to yeah. just launch into your story. Right? We're not accustomed to that in a, in a you know, conversation, classical conversation. But we, you have to really suppress the urge to do any of that time filling and just launch directly into it with no, no holds barred there. Just if you, if you want to get the maximum impact, because that's the time when people are assessing whether they like you or not. Mm. Don't, give them, don't give them a chance to decide that they don't like you. Just the, the only thing you want to present them with is a story to listen to. Because their phone is right there in their pocket. It's right there. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or they're literally watching you on it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. They're watching you on a device. So yeah. like, it's not even, it's not even like they have to reach for anything. It's right there and they can, you know, read the, read sports blogs while they listen to you. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, that's interesting. I was just wondering, can you, you know, if you're up on stage and you're giving a discussion like I'm, I'm always, try, I'm, I'm tend to be fairly empathetic and I, I'm sort of trying to see the mood of the room. Can you, mm -hmm. if you feel like you've lost the room, are there ways to, to get the room back? I mean, I, I know you're talking about preparing okay. and then having it up front, but like, what if you're in the middle of your speech and I've been there before where I started noticing the distraction. I'm like, Oh, I've lost, yeah. I've lost the room. Are there any, yeah. any advice for that or, or thoughts on that? Okay. So let me, let me start off with a little bit of therapy yeah. for you, John, and for anybody else who's listening to that. <laughs> say, oh yeah, I've had that experience before. Okay. So that's called hypervigilance. That's a thing that most people pick up through trauma in their childhood. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's an adaptive, it's a, both an adaptive and maladaptive skill. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. If you're interested in how, if you feel like you're a hypervigilant person where you're in situations where you can sense the mood of a room, where you can sense what somebody else is feeling very quickly in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And sometimes if you've ever asked somebody, um, what's wrong? If you've ever said, what's wrong? And the person is like, what are you talking about? You might be hypervigilant because what okay. you're doing is reacting to micro clues that the other, that the person may not even be aware that they're expressing. Okay. This is usually, if you're interested, it's usually like a product of some trauma or CPTSD as it's called complex PTSD. But anyway, blah, blah, blah. Hypervigilance is an excellent, it's an excellent tool in your tool belt to have when you're doing public speaking or sales. Because in both of those settings, you're able to kind of move and flow with your audience and understand where your audience is, in, is at all times. It's not so good in, you know, romantic relationships. You learn to, you learn to pull back on, you know, interrogating other people's emotions <laughs> all the time. Right. I found in my life. Okay. But so one of the things that you have to do is learn to be detached from that energy when you're up on stage and doing your speech, because undoubtedly you were... Um, hypervigilance is firing the wrong way. Okay. So you are picking up too many signals almost, almost every time that I felt this, you're picking up too many signals. And the reality is your speech is what it is. People are going to connect with you or they won't. The people who are now tuning you out, you have to just learn to ignore. And it's important. And I'll, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you something really interesting. I once gave, went up to give a speech in Mexico city. And the way that the room was organized at that speech was that the keynote stage was in the same room, brought a huge, you know, uh, convention center. The keynote speech was in the same room as the area where the lunch was being served. Oh. And I went on around 1230 
display. My keynote was around 1230. The audience is listening to me on translation headsets. So I'm speaking in English and a group of translators is translating, but most of the people are listening to me with them, with the Spanish translation. And three minutes into my speech, a gigantic mariachi band, 18 piece mariachi band fires up in the lunch area. Nice. Now it is in the same room as me. It isn't okay. You know, perhaps 200 feet away. But it's in the same room and it's a giant mariachi band. And if you've ever been in a room with a mariachi band, you will know you can't ignore the fact that the mariachi is playing. And so one of the things that immediately starts happening, the mariachi starts to play and I can see. So at first I just ignore it. I hear it and I ignore it. And I'll just, you know, I, I wall myself off from it. I feel the panic rising in my body. And so I've become over the years, I become conscious of that. And I'm able to kind of understand that, oh, that's just my panic but I don't have control of the situation. The mariachi's playing. Now I start to see people removing their headsets and looking around because they themselves are hearing it and they're confused about what's going on and why this loud mariachi is playing. And so I just keep going with my talk. And then at one point, there's a little moment where I can kind of like make fun of it. It's sort of relevant to the what I was saying. And, you know, so I just sort of started dancing to the beat of the mariachi at one point in the talk. And I was like, and if you stick around for Q&A afterwards, I'll show you some of my moves. People laughed. We all accepted that that was, that was happening and we moved on. Yeah. The thing that would have sunk me is panic. If I had allowed the panic to overtake me in that moment, I would have been absolutely sunk. The reason why I wasn't panicked, the reason why I can deal with people getting up and walking out of my speeches without being feeling completely derailed is because I know my material. Hmm. And I can continue forward with my material, even as that panicked voice is starting to scream and yell inside of me saying that people don't care. They've tuned you out. They don't like what you're saying. You know, you're losing the room. No. In my experience, I'm almost never, that's almost never right. Hmm. That's over an overreaction. So what you need to do is keep going. And then sidebar, if you really are losing the room and you really have lost the room and you really want to use a shock and awe tactic, the absolute that to bring back is to swear. Oh yeah, yeah. And really good public speakers. That's when they'll pull out. They'll pull out a, a, a blue word. Okay, I've seen it. I've seen it done. I've seen it done a couple of times. If you yeah. really feel like the room is like just gone out of control, you need you do yeah. something that kind of shocks everybody back into place. Just remember though, if you do choose to use a technique like that, you will also alienate people who won't like that. And certainly, if you're being recorded, yeah. I wouldn't do yeah. that. I would just say to you, your fear of losing the room probably overblown. Deal with you got to learn to deal with your own panic. Yeah, I just think it's more like you know you you sense that you know like I, here's the here's the deal the kind of speech that I gave. I was a factory manager for 22 years, so I did all employee meetings every month for 22 years. So hourly people are notoriously tired and and they're normally sure. on their feet, so they sit down and they're like. What you got, monkey? You know, what do you guys, yeah. like, you know, what, you got the monkey yeah. on stage, give it a presentation, right? And yeah. so I think what I'm saying from that point was like, they don't want to be there. You, you know, you're, you're trying to communicate what's going on with the business and what have you. So it's just one of those interesting things where, uh, yeah, I mean, you, 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 you know, some people really want to be there and care about the business and there's others that just don't care whatsoever, you know, and I those think people that. Yeah. Here's what I would say though. I, I think again, I would say, I think you've got to come back to the point of like your job. So every, every kind of communication, every conversation you have with anybody is persuasive, inherently mm. persuasive. Even a casual conversation is, is a persuasive opportunity for you. And as soon as you realize that, as soon as you realize that you're always trying to persuade and that people have agency, they can do whatever they want. You can settle into the idea that you're going to do the best job that you possibly can do. You're going to learn from the work that you do every single time. And you're going to probably move the needle a little bit on some people who might not be in your camp. That group of hourly employees that are not interested in paying attention to you, John, despite you putting in the best effort, they may not be winnable. No matter yeah, what you do. yeah. I, I can tell you, I, I've, I've actually been on stage and seen people asleep. And I'm like, yeah. All right. Yep. I'm just going to keep going, you know? So the one, yes, exactly. The one problem is you can't let your panic, you can't let your, your internal critic that says, Hey, you're not doing a good job. You're not, you're not keeping them engaged. You, you said you were going to do better this time and look, they're falling asleep. They're walking out 
on you. They're not paying attention to you, yeah. you're, you know, garbage. You have to learn to wrestle with that inner critic in that moment. Yeah. Um, and you have to learn to kind of move past it. Um, I think the more and more I did, well, more and more I did it over the years, I, I would always find it humorous, you know, like, and I think the, empl- yeah. the employees would see it because I'd look over and there was Jim asleep again. And I just, I'd yeah. shake my head and smile and they would all laugh. And they, it was sort of like a nonverbal communication. I'd just look over, I'd smile, you know, and it's sure. just, okay, there's Jim asleep again, you know, type of thing. So I think you, the more you do it, the more, the less you have that panic, it's more like, this is just the way some you know, 20% yeah. of these guys are going to, going to tune out because they, they're tired. They've been on their feet all morning, you know? Yeah, for sure. And one other thing that I, I often recommend, and I would say, you know, if you're really in that kind of environment, so if you're listening to this and you're really in that kind of environment where you have a lot of hostile, um, or, or highly disaffected meetings that you've got to be able to do and pull together, I'd highly recommend studying stand-up comedy a little bit and i talk about it yeah yeah the techniques of stand-up comedy are quite different from public speaking but they do have lessons to be learned and i talk about that in the aha method and you know one of the things that you can practice is your crowd work so you looking over at jim and kind of smiling shrugging it's a kind of crowd work you're acknowledging the crowd you're bringing that into the audience so you're connecting the audience together that's a skill set so obviously you've got you know, you've got a sense of humor. You're kind of a funny guy. You can learn by by observing um, how stand up comedians do that. And if you find that that's a frequent um, concern, you can take a stand up comedy class. No downside oh, yeah. Yeah. to that at all. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I do. I do. I enjoy comedy, and I do enjoy Same. the the technical side of it. I guess more like for sure how they how they capture a room, how they how they you know, especially like you mentioned. I, I listen to a lot of amateur comedy. And some guys get up there and say, oh, you know, they talk about, introduce themselves. How's everybody doing? And they they waste that moment. And the best ones yeah. come in and they, they're right on the joke, uh, right before they yeah. introduce themselves or anything. They're, 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 they're getting you down that pathway, which reminded me of what you said, which was don't waste those precious moments, get into your story. Yeah. 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 And I love that you brought that up. I, I highly encourage, I talk about it in the AHA method, studying comedians. Even if you're not a funny person, stand up comedians they they have a specific set of skills that are very useful here and not not always necessarily going to tell jokes like one of the things that i often point out is if you watch stadium comedians we're very fortunate in that, that now there's a lot of video of stadium comedians playing large rooms where ca- there's good camera work so you can really see the face of the comedian that's this last generation it's really it's really blown up so there's a lot of comedians you can watch and one thing if you watch really big stadium comedians when they're performing, the thing you always notice is that they crack themselves up. Yeah. They find yes. themselves really funny. Yeah. They think they're really funny, inherently funny. And, you know, you watch them tell this joke and they're kind of like, you can already see they're getting into position for the audience's reaction and they're really into what they're doing. And, you know, they've told that joke a hundred times. Yeah. Like by the time they're doing their Netflix special, they have told that joke a bunch, I promise you. As a speaker, as a leader doing communication, you need to bring that same energy to everything that you do. Yeah, yeah. You need to really enjoy yourself. You need to learn to love the sound of your own voice. And you need to have fun and enjoy it, even if you've done that same speech a dozen times. And I think the audience recognizes if you're having fun up there, yeah, if you're enjoying what you're doing, if you're nervous, they're going to see that. I mean, it's just, yeah, for sure. Yeah, they're going to know that too. But if you're having fun up there, they're going to they're going to enjoy the speech. It's, it's, yep. it's, it's contagious, you know? So yes, yeah, that makes right. a lot of sense. Well, this this has been fantastic. I feel like I could talk to you all, uh, all evening. But um, oh, thanks. What, what final message would you like to leave with our listeners on this subject? Yeah, I think um, no matter what happens in the workplace, right? We're we're in the middle of a lot of transitional stuff. Like you know, AI is probably top of mind for for everybody listening right now, and how it affects the world of work and leadership, and you know, it's you know making its way into every aspect of our lives. I think in more technologically forward future, a more artificially intelligent future actually raises the stakes for and the importance of real live communication with actual humans. Okay. It doesn't reduce it. It makes it more important. It doesn't make it less influential. It makes it more influential. This has always been the way that society has advanced. There's the waterline moves, right? Um, And then as that moves consistently throughout history, communication has been the skill that set leaders apart from, from everybody else. That is where, uh, you know, battles are won or lost, no matter how you want to look at it, whatever form of communication you want to look at. 
So, you know, I think this skill is incredibly important. I think it becomes even more important now. And I want to encourage everybody listening to, you know, if it's not the aha method in my book, but whatever you do, go out there, put the effort in, learn, learn how to, you know, speak more beautifully and, you know, level up your career with, with better speaking skills. I think it's a great way to sum up this conversation and absolutely listeners, you heard it, you know, you, this is something that you need to have as a skill set, and you can get better at it by reading, uh, uh, Gabe's book. You can, you can, you know, study speeches, but it, you know, like he said, it's a lot of work and it's not, you know, don't look for those hacks. There are still a few, but again, do, do, do the work, prepare and get your, uh, and, and get the audience's attention and, and, and these aha moments and, and all that he, that uh, Gabe talked about. These are very much essential uh, skills that we need as leaders. So uh, how can our listeners find out more about you, uh, this new book, and uh, your services? Oh, great. Well, you can find me very easily everywhere in the world, whatever social media platform you're using. If you type in Gabe, G-E-B-E, and then space, and then Z-I, I'm going to come right up. There's not that many people with my name pattern. So that's the easiest way to find Instagram, LinkedIn, wherever you like to be. If you want to find my website and the work, it's Gabe Zickerman, which is G-A-B-E and then Z-I-C-H-E-R-M-A-N-N.com. Fantastic. And we're going to put links in the show notes for all of Gabe's uh, resources. And again, uh, the book is called The AHA Method. And I highly recommend that if you are in any leadership position, you have any, uh, you know, speaking opportunities, Again, remember what Gabe told us. This is where you're going to gain sales, revenue, recruitment. This is where you're going to make money. So this has got to be a skill that you need to have as a leader. So I highly recommend that you uh, look up this book. And and if you have questions, reach out to Gabe and and ask him a question. He is the expert, and which is why he's here to tell us all about this idea of communication. So Gabe, I want to thank you for coming on the show and sharing uh, all your knowledge and experience in the subject. Thanks so much for having me, John. Well, thanks again. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.